we knew that, uh, you know, in the country that things were moving and that uh, we were interested in opening up all the facilities, uh, particularly, uh, you know, public accommodations. The civil rights movement was sort of in full gear at that time, and we were trying to knock down racial barriers as to where you could go, where you could eat, uh, where you could go to school. We wanted to have the right to go there if we so choose to. Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes walked into history books through a sea of embittered voices as they desegregated the University of Georgia in 1961. Educational institutions like the University of Georgia weren't the only public places in Athens where the mere mention of integration was a battle cry. In the early 60s, uh, 61, you had a group of adults uh, that uh, were very, very in, you know, instrumental in, in, in moving things along in terms of integrating Athens. Um, those key persons, you know, from the east side, from over the river, were uh, Miriam Moore, Miss um, Mamie Terrell. Um, you had uh, Mr. Jacob Red Weaver. Uh, he's a well-known person. And you had a host of others, uh, adults, uh, who at that time saw what was happening with Charlene Hunter and uh, Hamilton Holmes as they integrated university. And so this, this group of people, um, through relationships with Dr. King in Atlanta and other civil rights workers, uh, they established, created the first youth council here in Athens. I would say the kids, the children, did the most to bring about equality. And those kids would march, protest, go downtown, set in and integrate when them grown folks were scared to move. The Chili Dogs and Onion Rings made famous by the varsity became the backdrop of a little known movement. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, my mother, I used to go with my mother uh, to sign uh, African-Americans up to go to the predominantly white schools. So I had been involved in these things uh, a long time, a little while before the Varsity got there, even though I was a small kid. So when the Varsity came and it was time to, uh, you know, Brown versus Board had been decided and things was coming, it was time to knock some of those doors down. I was 14 years old when I began getting involved with the civil rights demonstrations. We were 16, 17, 18 years old. And where the oldest one probably was 17. But we all, we had to get permission from our parents that we could march. So many of our parents were really dependent upon white-owned businesses. And so it was a, it was a, it was a you know, delicate line for a lot of persons to really involve their kids to take the risk uh, to, uh, to allow it. I guess my folks were so poorly employed, it didn't matter one way or the other, okay? <laughs> We would get training. Uh, in fact, we would, our meeting place was in an old Reed Street uh, building. Actually, that was the, that was the first uh, black high school, Athens High Industrial School. And it was, I believe, it was built in 1915. 1915. So it, it really was the first high school, and it's just ironic how we wound up, you know, coming back there and getting our training. So they would teach us about, you know, how how to handle, you know, conflict or violence. They taught us that we couldn't fight back. Uh, even when they spit in our faces, we couldn't do anything. We just had to just stand there and take it. And we had, you know, whites to spit in our faces. Possibly being close to the African-American neighborhood, the one on Broad Street that, that was chosen that we were going to integrate. And that's where well, the difficult time came because they said, heck no. When the protest started at the Varsity, I had been employed as a colored policeman. They say we could only arrest colored. We didn't have nothing to do with white folks. It was just going to be colored. Demonstrations had been going on several weeks there. And on one side, the Klan was marching. On the other side, uh, the protesters were marching. The only thing they would tell us 
that they're going to be there. They will have their cup on. They're going to walk beside you. Mm -hmm. and, and you look straight ahead and you do what you're supposed to do. And the Klan had a headquarters uh, near the varsity. So they would run to their headquarters and get their little guns. We would run behind the bushes and get our bricks. And sometimes we would uh, tie up Broad Street entirely. They would have the set-ins at the varsity, and the police would come. But they knew that I wasn't going to do nothing. They knew I was going to get back in the car and go on back east because I tell them, shoot, I want to go in there just like them kids do. I think that the varsity was important because that's where the main uh, incarceration of, of uh, demonstrators was, was civil and taken downtown and dispersed at the courthouse in the stock case. One morning they picked all of us up and they carried us to the stock case but due to the fact that um, this particular time we didn't stay because there were they had us all outside. They wouldn't let us go inside. They just kept us out in the yard, all around the building, until somebody came to get us. But then the next time we went, we had already been told that we are going to stay overnight. We are not going to bail out anybody out. If you go to jail today, we're not bailing anybody out. And the reason for this is because the city would have to pay for us to eat, and that would cost them money. They had more people in the stock case, so that would cost them money for, to feed us at that particular time. One night, I don't, couldn't remember, it was close to the end of overt segregation. The kids from Ebenezer was coming to the varsity that night in a big number. The city had the police department. They had highway patrolmen. They had the buses. And they were going to make a mass arrest that night. They gave out the orders that they were going in the varsity and lock up everybody of color and take them to wherever they were going to take them. So Chief Hardy told them to get ready. I got in the police car. Hardy asked me, where was I going? I said, I ain't got nothing to do with this. This y'all's. This y'all being it. Hardy said, you refuse no order? I said, you want this badge? I said, I don't need no job. He stood there for a few minutes, and it got quiet, and it got quiet. And Chief Hardy said, <laughs> integration. Is here. He said, take them buses back and put them up and say, y'all get back in y'all vehicle and go on and do what y'all supposed to do, and we ain't finna do nothing. But the varsity was the tough thing. It was a big fight. It, it constantly went on and on until they finally just had to say we can integrate. Once they integrate, I found out I didn't like hot dogs. Personally, that, <laughs> that much myself. <laughs> <clears throat> After that, didn't go in there very much. I go in there now, I rally. But uh, a lot of people love the varsity, African American, and they should have the right to go, and they go. You can't put a fire out with fire. And we just had to, to use the power of nonviolence in order to get where we wanted to go.